So, the 2024 IndyCar season recently came to a close last month and saw Alex Palou become the first back-to-back -back champion since Dario Franchitti in 2011. Usually when a season finishes, or when it's on the cusp of finishing, there's often a lot of news surrounding what's happening in the following season, like for example Silly Season news. And there has been a lot already, such as Alexander Rossi moving over to Ed Carpenter Racing as a result of being booted out by McLaren to make way for Christian Lungard, Louis Foster after an amazing Indy Next campaign making his IndyCar debut with Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan Racing, and Marcus Armstrong moving over to Meyershank Racing alongside Freelix Rosenquist as a result of Meyershank switching technical allegiances from Andretti to Chip Ganassi. But if there was one news story that trumped all of them, it would have to be the one that broke in the build-up to the season finale at Nashville, and it was news that definitely divided opinion. The introduction of a charter system. So you may be wondering, what on earth is a charter system and why is it being implemented? Well, to put it simply, a charter system is basically an agreement between the series owner and the teams when it comes to how they conduct themselves in the series, a little bit like the Concord Agreement in Formula 1. The agreement will ensure that a team that agrees to this charter system will have a bit of a stake in the series, which will then give them a bit of leverage when it comes to negotiating deals with sponsors, investors, drivers and engines. Even if there are only two engines in IndyCar at the moment. Previously, there was only one company that was doing everything when it came to running the series, which was Penske Entertainment, ran by Roger Penske. This meant that the teams didn't have much of a say when it came to certain things, as apart from competing in the sport, they didn't have much value, other than their physical assets. Now, with this charter system, the teams will have more of a say on things in the sport, and will also gain more value if they decide they want to sell up at some point, as they will have more to gain by doing so than they did in the past, giving them a chance to recoup their losses. But giving teams more value in the sport isn't the only reason why this is being implemented. As we know, IndyCar for a while has become quite stagnant, with the series using a chassis that will be 13 years old once the 2025 season comes around, with this version of the chassis entering its 8th season in the sport, if you ignore the aero screen that was implemented in 2020, it hasn't been able to negotiate an international race, relying heavily on circuits that have a proven history in the sport and are pretty much regionalised, any new circuits they do introduce often leads to failure, which I hope Arlington, Texas doesn't fall into that same category, or in some cases, sticking their middle finger up to the fans, such as the Thermal Club. And on top of all of that, and as I alluded to earlier, it hasn't been able to attract a third engine manufacturer. Right now, the series is in a situation where manufacturers outside of GM and Honda don't see any benefit in entering the series, as although the likes of Ferrari and Mercedes have been rumoured to enter IndyCar in the past, even with the hybrid technology which IndyCar were late to implement, I don't see a third manufacturer entering any time soon. Like seriously, who at IndyCar thought it was a good idea to implement a new engine formula midway into an active season? That was always going to cause problems, as seen during the second half of the season. I mean, fair enough, these problems are no longer as common as what they were at Mid-Ohio and Iowa, but still, surely it was better to implement them at the beginning of next season to avoid these issues. I get there was pressure from Honda, but come on, common sense had to prevail. Anyways, I've gone a bit off topic here. The fact is, whilst the third manufacturer won't be entering the series anytime soon, having this charter system may encourage a third manufacturer to consider entering in the future, especially if this charter system provides the extra value that the series is looking for. Hopefully, it will also encourage an international venue to consider bringing IndyCar back to the global market, and as someone who lives in the UK, I would love for IndyCar to make its quote-unquote return to the UK, whether that's at Brands Hatch, Silverstone, or even Donington. Any excuse to bring my local circuit up in this video, I suppose. <laughs> now, you might be sitting there thinking, 
Okay, well what's your issue with this charter system? As given the title you've given for this video, it suggests that you are not the biggest fan of it. So what's the issue here? Because to me, it doesn't sound too bad. Well, there is one key bit of information that I have not mentioned yet, which is stopping me from being all for this system. And that is with the number of slots that are available on the charter and what they will be rewarded with if they sign up. For the first edition of the charter system, which will run out at the end of 2031, 25 slots will be available that will spread across all the teams that sign up to it. For this edition, 10 teams have signed up to it, which were the 10 teams that competed in the 2024 season, which are on your screen right now, along with the number of cars that they will be running. As a result of these teams signing up, they will have a guaranteed place on the starting grid for every race that takes place between 2025 and 2031, apart from the Indy 500, which is the only race that the charter system won't have any bearing on. Now what you may have noticed from the teams that have signed up is that there is one team that will be taking part in 2025 that is missing from the charter system and that team is Prama Racing who will be making their debut in 2025 running a two car program. This means that not only do they risk not qualifying for a race but they also don't get any money from the winner's circle as only the teams who have signed up for the charter system will be eligible to compete for the winner's circle with the top 22 car slots from the charter system receiving money from the prize pool at the end of the year. And because the current charter system runs out at the end of 2031, it means that if Prema want to be a part of this system before the 2031 expiration date, they will need to purchase slots from an existing charter team. But if we're being brutally honest here, what team is going to want to do that? Now luckily for Prema, them not signing up for the charter system won't have too much bearing on them in 2025 as with the agreement allowing 27 slots for every race apart from the Indy 500 which is 33, Prema will thankfully be able to qualify for every race outside the Indy 500 as there will be a total of 27 cars that will be competing next year. However, say at some point after 2025, a team like Axel Motorsport decide to enter a full-time program, or a team like Dreyer and Rheinbowl Racing decide to go full-time instead of doing the Indy 500, it will end up screwing over the new teams. They could end up going faster than some of the charter entries during qualifying, but because these charter entries have a guaranteed slot on the grid, their performance isn't going to matter. You could have these new teams qualifying in the top 27, but because some of the charter entries are outside that threshold, some of the new teams won't end up on the grid regardless. Does this remind you of something? Like the title of this video suggests, it reminds me of the proposed European Super League project that rocked the world of football at the beginning of 2021, where 15 European clubs who had become the founding members of the tournament would be given a guaranteed slot and wouldn't need to go through the traditional way of qualifying for the tournament, essentially creating a franchise, whereas the other five teams who would make up the rest of the 20-team tournament would have to still qualify the traditional way via their domestic leagues. This is what this charter system has essentially implemented and unless these new teams end up buying an existing charter of one of the teams that have signed up to it, they will continue to get screwed over whilst the 10 teams signed up to the charter system will continue to flourish regardless of their performance. To me, whilst I see the benefits of a charter system and understand why IndyCar has had to do this, at the same time, it feels like, just like with the hybrids, that the whole thing has been rushed through, with IndyCar trying to fix an issue that they created themselves, with it feeling like it hasn't been thought through properly. Now I hope for IndyCar's sake that this charter system ends up working out for them in the long run, but if it ends up falling flat on its arse and necessary tweaks aren't made to it in order to not screw over any potential new teams, then I do fear it could have dramatic consequences for the series. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Are you in favour of a charter system or do you believe it's a bad idea? Thanks for watching, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already and I will see you next week for the next video.